At the core of Ninja Gaiden 3 lies the still-satisfying, fast-paced, brutal swordplay that the 3D Ninja Gaiden games excel at. Team Ninja's talent shines through with its animation that in both combat and cutscene imbues the title with a tremendous sense of energy. Ryu Hayabusa clashes with enemies and environments with the monumental impact you've come to expect from the series. With the basics in place and a sleek graphical look while targeting 60 frames per second, the stage should have been set for another exciting and compelling Ninja Gaiden adventure on par with prior entries. However, the end result ends up being super disappointing. Outside of these fundamentals, Ninja Gaiden 3 files away pretty much everything else 3D Ninja Gaiden gameplay had to offer, creating this bafflingly streamlined interpretation of the series. Gone are upgrade shops to customize or enhance weapons. Gone are any melee weapons other than swords. The story mode only gives you one Nimpo magic attack. Essence pickups have been removed from the game, there are no collectibles at all, even boss health bars don't make the cut. In place of all this, climbing minigames, walking segments, and quick time events. The game has taken on this very minimal, simplified approach to design, which is very odd for a series that up until now, especially with its second game, had reveled in excess. It doesn't really take much on my part to emphasize why this lack of content is a step backwards from NG2 and NG1. It's also glaringly in your face that you're getting so much less to work with here. I have no idea who out of their established fanbase they expected would boot this up and go, Oh great, so much less than last time. This lack of variety turns the game into a slog. It's ironic that a really cool feature, being able to bring up a combo list in real time while playing, gets wasted on a Ninja Gaiden lacking in weapons. In the following month after NG3's original release, the Metal Claws and Scythe were offered up as free DLC for the campaign. Cold comfort, perhaps, if you had already beaten the game on release, but it's better than nothing and hard to complain if they're at least free. Even if still charging money for their use in the extra missions is weirdly stingy. If you're living in a year where the online infrastructure is up and running for the console you have your version of the game on, feel free to get them. Even if being generous and factoring these free add-ons in as part of our overall assessment of the game, two extra weapons still doesn't put this game on par with what was available to use in prior entries, and both of them being based on weapons from two instead of being wholly original tools doesn't exactly help Three's campaign stand on its own in the way the third entry in this trilogy should be able to. When two introduced to the claws, they were a novel enough gameplay edition to be proudly displayed on the box art, flaunting the new feature. 3 is really hurting for something equivalent. NG3 just gives you very little reason why you'd want to play as Ryu in this game instead of booting up older entries. Even enemy variety is lower than in past entries. Outside of bosses, you'll spend most of your time fighting soldiers with different uniforms, wave after wave of them, with maybe a brief respite from that to take on just a handful of monster variants, a gang of wizards who caved and bought the pixelizer, or a guest appearance by the returning Black Spider Ninja Clan. You can dig deeper into the extra missions outside of the campaign for more foes not featured in the story, but you'll just be running into a selection of repurposed two enemies. Essence strikes me as one of the worst omissions. In prior NG games, it made for some extremely tense and exhilarating moments. In the older games, when an enemy was killed and they released an Essence pickup, it made for a tantalizing choice. Let Ryu automatically absorb the Essence to just receive the upgrade points, or absorb the essence manually to quickly activate a charge attack in wicked time. It's hard to resist manually absorbing in that essence for a quicker charge attack, but of course, it's not always ideal to do that right after killing a foe. Even with the quicker charge, do you have the time and the space to do it before the next enemy comes for you? Rarer blue and red essence granted health restoration and nimpo ammo respectively, but wouldn't if manually absorbed for an attack. That would already be a tricky trade-off to weigh up in a dicey moment where a quick charge attack could be useful. But to make the choice even more interesting, one blue or one red essence would charge your sword twice as much as the more common yellow essence. The games were basically asking you if you were willing in the moment to give up more health or nimpo in exchange for very quick action 
access to one of Ryu's most powerful moves. These were all knuckle-biting decisions you'd have to make after killing almost every enemy. You could even hold block to prevent auto-picking up the essence for a moment, to perhaps get yourself in a better position for manually absorbing and charging. You can even get cheeky with it, blocking and unblocking to isolate, say, a single blue essence from a group, thereby receiving its health energy, while leaving other essence out in the open you want to use in a moment for a charge attack. There was a lot to consider. The elimination of essence in Ninja Gaiden 3 gets rid of this entire dynamic. Now you just get given an ultimate attack for killing a bunch of enemies and can pick when to turn it on quickly and mostly stress-free. Since Ryu can hold on to an ultimate attack for as long as he needs mid-fight, once acquired it's pretty easy to let off safely as you can take your time to find a free spot and moment to use it. When risk is taken out of the equation, reward gets heavily dampened. This implementation of ultimate attacks is so much more generic, and removes a fairly unique take on charge attacks that helped set Ninja Gaiden apart. Crippled enemies can still be taken out with an obliteration technique like in Ninja Gaiden 2, an elaborate final attack that zooms in all epic. But in NG3, once the average human enemy is weakened enough for this to be performable on them, they're already incapacitated and out of the fight. They can't attack you anymore like the common enemies in 2 could. Putting them out of their misery can only serve to give you a little boost of key to work towards activating your Nimpo attack. Later, when the Black Spider Ninja Clan reemerge, some critically damaged enemies do have the ability to keep attacking. They can perform suicide runs and still pose a threat while in that weakened, obliterated state like in 2. Somewhat ironically, if you attack these ninjas in their weakened state, they'll be subject to one of the least elaborate obliteration moves in the game, however. Not really befitting of their more dangerous abilities. It's weird for the obliteration techniques to receive this change in implementation in the rest of the title, though. These insane obliteration animations can't help but lose a bit of their impact, when most of the time it's just Ryu tap dancing on an enemy already out of the fight, rather than him putting the brakes on an incoming brutal attack. A move that proves more useful than obliteration in Ninja Gaiden 3 is the new steel on bone technique, a devastating slice attack once again highlighted by a camera zoom to punctuate the moment. Once performed, you can keep mashing the quick attack button to continue slashing into other enemies for a chained series of critical hits. The issue is this attack can pop up completely at random. Quick attack input, strong attack input, at any point in a combo it can just trigger out of nowhere. Pretty much any ground input in a potential combo chain from the first all the way to the last can get interrupted by steel on bone, it's weird. One ground sword input though that doesn't seem like it can trigger SOB is the first quick attack in a potential combo. I stood around testing to see if a single quick attack could trigger SOB in various battles throughout the game, and it seemed to not be possible. On the flip side, a single strong attack input can trigger SOB pretty frequently. But what was a baffling discovery is that a single quick attack can actually trigger SOB, but seemingly only at specific moments in specific battles, like at the start of this fight with the first group of enemies in the game, or when attacking your first dual knife guy in this encounter. It's very odd to start a game and have an attack trigger from another move that will for the most part not be triggering said attack again. A standard strong attack will also consistently activate SOB in these specific instances at the start of these two specific fights. I don't know why the game thinks it's so essential for SOB to activate here that a single quick attack will also trigger it for these one-offs. It's so absurdly determined for SOB to pop off immediately in these instances that it will even have it trigger from a move it otherwise doesn't trigger from. This is all based on the sword combat, by the way, but from what I can tell, the DLC weapons behave in the same way. No single quick attack SOB, except for in these very particular moments. I'm probably only screaming scratching the surface of how bananas the implementation of Steel on Bone is in NG3 in this video by mentioning stuff like these weird isolated single quick attack triggers. The point I'm trying to make by bringing up anomalies like this is that Steel on Bone is just all over the place here. These inconsistencies make it very hard to understand how Steel on Bone works when you start playing NG3. Kinda feels like SOB pops off more often on certain inputs in certain combos more than others. But since sometimes those specific inputs don't trigger it, 
it's hard to know for sure. Even if there were inputs in certain strings that made SOB more likely, that would still be classified as a random trigger, right, and ultimately still unreliable. There is a way to reliably trigger steel on bone manually, and it's to slide into a foe that's already taken a bit of damage and catch them in the air with a strong attack. Exploiting this is actually surprisingly fun. Any agency the game gives you over the move is undermined, I think, though, by the fact that it's just popping off on its own so often anyway. Combine the frequency of steel on bone with obliteration attacks that you'll inevitably be triggering while mashing around town too, as well as the super-powered ultimate technique, and Ninja Gaiden 3's combat feels like it's spending half its time zooming in for these scripted, intricate takedowns. It's just too much. Crafting combos falls by the wayside as extravagant finishes take over. Spectacle here has become the priority, and when it's happening seemingly at the game's whim without the player's input sometimes, like with Steel on Bone, kills achieved through said spectacle fail to feel rewarding. Even when given the chance to give the player some more control over these moves, NG3 drops the ball with some bonehead decision. Like, for example, tying obliteration moves to both strong and quick attack inputs. This can result in accidentally triggering an obliteration move you didn't intend when mashing quick attack to chain steel on bone. The quick time event sequences that litter the game feel very out of place in a series that had up until now avoided resorting to them. Essentially cutscenes that require you to hit the right button when prompted to see the cutscene continue uninterrupted. Fail to do this and you might take damage or be forced to restart the sequence. In terms of mechanical challenge and complexity, they're the polar opposite of the action gameplay presented throughout the rest of the title even in Ninja Gaiden 3. In a fast-paced, demanding action game like Ninja Gaiden, they create an especially odd whiplash. All of a sudden, you, the player, are kind of chilling out relative to a moment ago. But Ryu is still doing death-defying stunts and attacks, with everything on screen framing what's happening as just as, if not more intense, as the core combat. Now, we can argue all day over in which games and in what scenarios quick time events may be appropriate, but I think it's hard to argue that that slight whiplash isn't usually there if the game has complex combat outside of its quick time sequences. You may argue, and sometimes I might even argue, that their inclusion in some cases may be worth that whiplash. But I think in most cases, action titles do better without said disconnect. And I think a series that has been super effective in being exciting and dramatic without them up till now especially doesn't need to add them. Why risk adding the disconnect? I think for the most part in an action game, the situations where the playable character is in the most danger should be the ones where the player is in the most control, and then the difficulty of the situation the character finds themselves in should be reflected in a relative sense through the mechanics, at least on whatever is considered the intended difficulty setting, I suppose. This is something I've always praised the 3D Ninja Gaiden games for. In combat, you are constantly under an intense assault, and more so than in most action games, you feel that. Enemies don't hang back or give you any leeway, they're fast and aggressive, and you have to be on the ball like Ryu to stand a chance. So for this series, it feels like a bit of a betrayal to go this route. You can say that we shouldn't expect to have complete control over every elaborate move an action game protagonist does, but I think far too much of that control gets taken away in Ninja Gaiden 3, especially when the walking segments start. I won't go into a big rant on walking segments in action games, but it's safe to say they add an unavoidable stop and start to Ninja Gaiden here, that wasn't present in prior entries. In those games when you were in control of Ryu, it wasn't in degrees based on what point of the level you were at. It was you and the full breadth of Ryu's moveset until you'd gotten out the other side of the level, and I can't say changing that adds anything to the game except time-wasting. I'm perhaps more lenient towards walking segments where Ryu is being weakened by the curse he has in this game. You could argue here that his inability to move fast is just as much out of his control as the player's. But when Ryu makes the choice to walk when I don't, it's especially aggravating for me. It feels like we're not on the same page anymore and I'm no longer embodying the character by playing. 
I will say that NG3 attempts to integrate quick-time events into overall gameplay with a little more finesse than most action games that try do. Your inputs and what kind of move they carry out will remain consistent across both combat and quick-time event. If Ryu needs to jump in a quick-time event, you'll always need to hit the jump button. If he needs to attack in one, you hit the attack button, to dodge, the dodge button, etc. Turning off tutorials will even turn off the button prompts in these sequences, and while there are a few instances where this will put you at a disadvantage, it is surprising how often the game does communicate well without an on-screen button what to do. Like when Ryu reaches for his sword, indicating you need to hit the attack button. If you're going to add these kind of sequences, I appreciate this touch though I still don't think it fully justifies the segments. It's also worth pointing out how the dynamic has shifted here. We've gone from me, the player, telling Ryu what move to do, putting us in the character's shoes, to Ryu informing me instead what button he wants me to hit so he can do the move he wants to do. The weirdest segments are the timed climbing challenges. They're pretty tedious and repetitive. Rather than create, say, a platforming stage where the player has to overcome a treacherous obstacle course, now the level designer can just place a vertical wall in the stage and call it a day. In terms of complexity, they're very shallow compared to the combat, but unlike the quick time events, they actually require a bit of tight timing to get right, which makes them boring but also potentially frustrating. They do eventually get more complex, but I don't think anyone would take these over just having some actual platforming sequences in their place, in which you could craft a far more compelling, less restrictive challenge. It's funny how much Ninja Gaiden 3 slows you down for spectacle when out of any game in the trilogy it probably has some of the blandest environments. I said the graphics engine looked sleek, but in terms of art design, I'd say the game is outclassed by the prior entries. The most memorable section of the game is probably when Ryu and Mamiji fight around the body of a giant witch, a segment which, funnily enough, has very little to do with the main plot of the game. With the walking segments and quick time events serving as the connective tissue between different parts of the stage now, the levels feel very segmented. Rather than getting to use Ryu's basic moveset to naturally carve a path through the level yourself, making it feel at least a bit like an actual place you're being set loose in, stages here come across more like a series of divided up combat arenas you might as well be selecting one by one from a list. So many minigames and quick time events divide the world up into chunks here. It's fair to say that 2's linearity also gave way to more of this sense that you were taking on one long corridor of enemies relative to one's more open level design. But in 2, I think there was much more of an attempt than in 3 to make the linear levels feel somewhat like more tangible places. There were points of no return that gated off prior areas, but a much greater attempt to create a sense of cohesion, as you jumped down holes or found secret passages yourself, without the game taking away control. There were longer segments of uninterrupted environment traversal. There being collectibles and secrets of some kind also also helped flesh things out in a way NG3 doesn't. While a lot of Ninja Gaiden 3 seems poised to cater to a newer, more casual audience, with so many facets of the series being simplified, one area that gets simplified that could be argued to be serving long-time players more is the eradication of upgrade and item purchases. The removal of restorative items you can hold onto and activate via the menu means that bar switching difficulties, players must earn passage through the game via combat prowess alone in every battle. You can't cheese a fight here by stockpiling items and drip feeding them to yourself. You could argue the inclusion of the ability to switch difficulties mid playthrough negates pretty much any attempt to make the game harder since there's always an out. But I think there's also an argument to be made that it's more appropriate for a player to be allowed to switch into a difficulty that will offer them a satisfying challenge more appropriate to their lower skill level than offering them items to circumvent challenge on higher difficulty levels. Letting you switch down to the easy mode Hero mode mid playthrough is one thing, but what I think probably shouldn't be allowed is how the game lets you choose to go back up to normal again in that same run. Even when allowed mid playthrough, a decision like that should probably be permanent, so as to not become such an exploitable and tempting difficulty modulator. Though at least hard mode seems to scupper this trick. There, if you lower the difficulty, you can't push it back up to hard in the same playthrough unlike how you can return to normal if you drop to easy. 
Getting rid of restorative items can be justified as a way to make the game more hardcore without hurting the overall experience in a significant way. But I think not having an upgrade system in NG3, no matter what the intention, does have a negative impact here that's hard to ignore. There's a lot of reasons to put an upgrade system in an action game. Having new moves be extrinsic rewards for performing well at various tasks throughout the title is a solid, albeit easy way to incentivize engagement. But I think a much more valuable reason to include an upgrade system is so a game can dole out new abilities at a consistent, perhaps slower rate to not let play get overwhelmed. You purchase a new move or ability, spend some time drawing out and discovering what it can achieve and how it works, before unlocking another additional move to complement it, and so on and so on. You're made more aware of every move in the game and what each one does because you're manually attaching them to the protagonist yourself. Spending hard-earned in-game currency on one also perhaps incentivizes a player to make the most of the ability they purchased, so as to not waste their investment. Pacing out the acquisition of moves can of course be very helpful to new players entering a series for the first time. But also veteran players, if the game is including new moves unique to the latest installment, or reintroducing old moves that have been implemented slightly different with new controls or added functionality. So as a returning player, you might boot up NG3 and initially think, hey, maybe no upgrade system is a good thing. If all Ryu is gonna have for melee combat is a sword, then perhaps not having to upgrade all over again is just foregoing needless busy work for the veteran, who's probably already committed a lot of hours to unlocking sword moves in many prior NG games, not released that long before this one. Even the DLC weapons are NG2 weapons, so you might apply a similar logic there as well. But this line of argumentation starts to fall apart pretty quickly. Even for veterans, I could see an upgrade system being useful here. Even though there's a lot less to work with overall than in prior entries, and what's here seems to be largely just reused concepts from past games, a decent amount has changed with how NG3's combat mechanics work. Perhaps not enough to make the game feel that original relative to past titles, but enough to where a returning player is still gonna have to readjust and learn some new things. The combo system has been given a bit of a remix. If NG3 had just taken the sword play exactly as it was in NG2 and slapped it in here, then I could see the argument for foregoing an upgrade system to cater to returning players. But I think there's a lot here to justify some kind of upgrade system. Between the addition of Steel on Bone and other reworked abilities, I could have seen an upgrade system helping immensely to clarify how this game works for players of every skill level. For example, what if the slide trigger for Steel on Bone was an unlockable upgrade, drawing attention to its existence and making it clear how it works. Keep in mind that it's technically inaccurate to even claim Ninja Gaiden 3 offers up all its moves from the get-go and just asks the player to figure out how it all works as part of some Megamind trial by fire. It still locks away some moves until later into the game when Ryu switches out his sword for a new variant. It simply locks away the sword moves off to these later segments of the title. But an upgrade system could have perhaps let a player access them earlier. Maybe through choice, in exchange for getting other moves later instead, or by skill, playing well enough to get the upgrade points needed to access the ability sooner. It can be confusing to even initially understand this blade is needed to access some moves, since the move list in the campaign doesn't grey out combos that Ryu can't actually do yet. I could see this being confusing for players of all skill levels, but especially newbies. Not being given a clear indicator of when certain moves are now available, an inexperienced player may early on just assume they don't understand how to properly execute these combos without knowing they just aren't unlocked yet. This is a weird lack of clarity for a title that otherwise seems to be trying to appeal to a newer casual demographic. If we were to add an upgrade system into NG3 though, I think it could still use some reworking from what we've seen in past entries. Past NGs were hesitant to offer the player much of a choice when it came to upgrading a weapon. Weapons were upgraded in a linear fashion, moves being given in bulk as part of each level. This barred you from selecting a specific combo or ability from the entirety of Ryu's moveset until certain others had been acquired first. I think a more choice-driven upgrade system for the Ninja Gaiden series would be a good compromise for everyone. Letting returning players pick whatever move they want to unlock first, while pacing ability acquisition out 
nicely for players of other skill levels. When sufficient choice is added to the mix, even re-unlocking old moves can be offered some zest for a returning player, as they build out their character around their favorite techniques. I think an upgrade system with a lot of choice is a solid way to not let players get bored unlocking returning moves while helping newer players to whom all the moves in the game are new, since those newbies might benefit from unlocking moves at a slower, more deliberate rate. Keep in mind that while I think what I've brought up here are legitimate issues with the traditional NG upgrade system, I'm more so addressing the shortcomings the older NG's upgrade system presented in the context of whether or not it would work in NG3, which I think is not very well. Weapons having to be customized in such a rigid linear fashion in the older NG games was an issue alleviated a lot by the amount of weapons there were in those titles. At various points, you still had a fair amount of choice when it came to which one to upgrade. Hence why I think a hypothetical upgrade system implementation for 3 couldn't just be a transplant of the old one. Such a dearth of extra weapons here would cripple a decision-making process at the core of upgrading in the older titles. I guess we've drilled back down into the bigger issue, really. The larger problem in NG3, regardless of how abilities are presented to you or acquired, is the relatively low amount of abilities that are here compared to past entries, with the lack of extra weapons now. Ninja Gaiden 3 puts more of a focus on its story than the prior titles. Tell me about the dinosaurs. And if this video ends up feeling like it spends a lot of time talking about the story, let it be known it's only because the game is putting a lot more emphasis on the narrative this time around. In Ninja Gaiden 3, Ryu is lured into a trap by a group of terrorists who weaken him with a curse that forces him into the occasional walking segment. To stop them and maybe undo this curse, Ryu sets about tracking down the leader of the group, the Regent of the Mask. Now in concept, I quite like this character. A cheeky, playful rival to play off Ryu's no-nonsense demeanor. Well done! As I would expect from a dragon ninja, where you go, bodies lie in your wake. And you will join them. The design of these two characters also complement each other really well, in surprisingly smart ways. Regent's design is reminiscent of the Phantom of the Opera, a character who in the book of the same name wreaked havoc behind the scenes of the opera. Ryu is a ninja, but what's fitting is that he's a ninja dressed in black here. Stagehands called Koroko in Japanese theater would dress in all black to indicate to the audience they were invisible. This way they could make adjustments during a scene without interrupting the actors. Since their role involves sneaking around in the background, they're often compared, associated, and even mistaken for ninjas. Some even believe that the depiction of ninjas in all black disguises throughout popular culture is derived from the look of the Kuroko. So I kind of like the idea of these two characters with theatrical connotations to their designs doing battle behind the scenes of the world stage. One trying to cause chaos and sow disorder while the other tries to put things back where they were without being noticed, mirroring the stage roles their designs make reference to. It's like Ryu is the theater police sent in to stop the Phantom of the Opera. You lack a sense of aesthetics, my friend. After all, doesn't the art of your country teach you to appreciate austerity and the elegance of decay? Unfortunately, while neat conceptually and having a cool design, as a character, Regent falls a little flat. Near the end of the game, we discover he's been under mind control the whole time when fighting Ryu. The mask controlled him through an AI. Which means we're forced to throw the entire rivalry in the bin for the most part. Only the final fight in which Regent basically sacrifices himself to undo Ryu's curse has any weight to it. But it's undercut by the fact that we've only really met this character properly for the first time like 20 minutes ago. Now that here at the end, he's not a mind-controlled puppet anymore. The main question posed by Ninja Gaiden 3's story is, how bad of a guy is Ryu? Hero? Or murderer? Which is the true face of Ryu Hayabusa? His curse is said to be a manifestation of all those he has slain tormenting him, and throughout the title the villains taunt him with the accusation that he's nothing but a cold-blooded murderer, a ruthless killer that does nothing but destroy. Ryu Hayabusa, we're cut from the same cloth! Look at your right hand! That is the symbol of all the lives you have taken, all the people you have killed! Make no mistake! 
You are an assassin of the darkness. After two games that didn't delve into Ryu as a character much, this is quite a bold direction to take things. We kick off this examination with one of the title's most infamous sequences. Not me, mate. Not me! Where the player is forced to kill a mercenary begging for his life. Listen, I'm just trying to feed my kid! Please, don't come any closer! I'm pretty torn on this moment. On the one hand, I don't think it's the most out-of-character thing for Ryu to do. He does kill a lot of people throughout the series with cold efficiency, so I'd say it was a pretty effective, powerful moment to see one of the games sober us up to Ryu's actions. By presenting us with an opponent's prolonged, uncomfortably human reaction to being on the verge of death at the hands of Ryu, relative to what we've seen in past installments. That said, I can't help but feel like it's a little bit disingenuous while in Ninja Gaiden 3, critically wounded enemies will beg for their lives and obliteration techniques are predominantly used to execute those already incapacitated foes, Help me. prior in the series, we don't really see Ryu execute anyone who isn't still trying to actively kill him, or foes who are begging for their lives. Throughout the series, for a ninja, he doesn't really stealth kill that much either. And it's fair to say that when he does, he's neutralizing a still potential threat. It's also worth pointing out that Ryu, in previous games, doesn't do anything to indicate he's in denial about his role as a vicious killer. Taking three at face value, though, he would seem to be in total denial about it. It's all right, Kana. You don't have to be afraid of him. I'm not scary. This line, to me, makes it pretty much impossible to take this game's character study seriously in the slightest. I think it just seems ridiculous that a human being with such an insanely high body count as Ryu Hayabusa would say the words, I'm not scary, sincerely. Either he's completely delusional and in need of some serious self-reflection, which he never really gets in this game, or the writers genuinely think this character is just a huge misunderstood teddy bear, which is perhaps even more crazy. Ultimately, I would have probably let them have this macabre execution moment if this examination of Ryu's actions had really been taken anywhere in this game. But as I just mentioned, this game fails on that pretty much completely. In in this title, Ryu never re-examines his modus operandi or really questions whether he perhaps is murdering too many people in any meaningful way. The bigger issue perhaps though is that he doesn't try to justify it either. Does he think the ends always justify the means? Does he just not care who dies if they still present any kind of threat? Does he have some rationale about who deserves to live and who doesn't? We see his actions, but I think it's a mistake not giving us his take on them at all. If we are supposed to be exploring this aspect of the character, we have no baseline to understand why he does what he does, and when confronted with the question of whether killing people in vast numbers is ever justified or inherently makes him a bad guy, he doesn't really reflect much on the dilemma. It feels like such wasted air spending all this time posing this moral question, and then giving us so little to work with when it comes to answering it. If I went through every way I'd personally tweak the story of NG3 so as to better capitalize on the premise of a more introspective Ninja Gaiden game, I'd be here all day. But I do want to point out what I think are some of the bigger missed opportunities. Between levels, Ryu hangs out with some government agents in these briefing rooms, which already feels very out of place in a series that was once happy to cut straight from the top of the Statue of Liberty to Venice, with no other excuse than that there's lichens in the latter location. What I'm surprised by is that the game doesn't take this opportunity to highlight the barbarity of Ryu's modus operandi by perhaps having his new teammates react a little bit uneasy about how he enacts justice on the battlefield. Sure, someone like your government agent sidekick in this game is probably more used to conflict than the average person, but you'd think she'd still have maybe a few misgivings about sending the human cheese grater into the field, but nope. Impressive. Crazy, but impressive. She called me a murderer. No! I think highlighting a contrast in tactical output and general demeanor between Ryu and his new bureaucratic allies could have been cool to see. 
and help to further percolate those feelings of doubt the game keeps implying we're now supposed to be having in regards to how Ryu goes about global conflict resolution. But for the most part, it's the people Ryu's trying to kill who complain about that the most, and you know, they're a little biased. We could have seen a really interesting dynamic form as these by-the-book agents have to form an alliance with this alien killing machine. A new relationship which could have been offered even more context by a chapter like the one where you return to Ryu's village. A difference in dynamic when Ryu instead works with someone who was raised with his same code and ethical framework like Mamiji could have been highlighted. This might have been able to draw out a lot of introspection from the cast, and especially Ryu. Instead, Ryu is welcomed with open arms by these modern-day agents, seemingly having developed weirdly adept social skills between games. This disciplined assassin, raised in an anachronistic hidden society, now behaves with the same casual warmth and understanding you might see from a PR-coached celebrity being interviewed on a chat show. Your legend precedes you, you know. Nothing but stories. Kana doesn't talk much. There was an accident. You see, at the end of the day, the villains making reference to Ryu's kill count doesn't end up serving much more of a purpose than for foreshadowing a plot device that triggers the final boss. The baddies trick Ryu into killing a little girl's dad in front of her, which upsets her enough to make her turn into a giant rage god because of some ancient bloodline stuff. <laughs> I don't know if this really serves as an indictment of Ryu's behavior as a whole, though. It is her dad. She probably would have been mad whether this was the first person Ryu had killed or the 10,000th. So basically, the villains are just making fun of Ryu throughout the game because they know they're going to take advantage of his propensity to kill people to summon their kaiju, which in retrospect seems kind of stupidly brazen. I would have assumed they wouldn't have wanted him to think at all about reassessing his eagerness to kill his opponents then. You'd think falling for this trick, seemingly executing an innocent and causing a calamity, would be the moment we finally get some reflection on Ryu's part, where maybe he questions how he goes about things. But no. I killed Kana's father right in front of her. She called me a murderer. He sulks for two seconds, acts sad he got called a murderer by an eight-year-old, and then goes back to business as usual. He ends up not even having to sweat the whole killing an innocent part, because it turns out the blow wasn't even fatal. Though it's not like his conscience needed alleviating there or something. It doesn't seem like Ryu was gonna reflect on this, whether the guy was dead or not. To wrap things up, a friendly character cast as the voice of reason drops this sentiment on Ryu. You are not a murderer. <laughs> You're not exactly a hero, either. Guess that's what it means to be a ninja. The game basically shrugs, goes, oh well, who knows, and tries to pull the wool over our eyes before the credits by laying out what I feel is a pretty disingenuous final assessment of Ryu's character. Presumably trying to quickly excuse they've drawn attention to this whole subject matter, so we don't have to think about it again whenever there's another Ninja Gaiden. You are not a murderer. <laughs> You're not exactly a hero, either. Well, it's, it's kind of the opposite, isn't it? He is kind of a murderer, but he also is a hero. And that's the actually interesting and uncomfortable contradiction that the Ninja Gaiden game that most wants us to notice said contradiction has nothing to actually say about and fails to wrestle with at every turn. It would rather suddenly act like the man who just saved the world while killing a lot of people is neither hero nor killer, so as to not actually have to comment on the whole issue any further. Drawing attention to the dark implications of your protagonist being both hero and killer may serve to make your title look deep in the moment, but with this final hand wave, it seems like it isn't a badge Ninja Gaiden feels comfortable wearing or acknowledging beyond this one game. It's not that by bringing up the subject of Ryu's ethics that NG3 had to try and communicate some profound message at the end, but if by the time the game is ending, Ryu hasn't reflected or changed at all after being confronted with these issues, and if you're telling us not to think about them anymore before the credits roll, then I do wonder what the point of addressing these topics was. It probably sounds like I'm really banging on about this stuff, but I think how this game handles these topics deserves the scrutiny I'm applying here, given how constantly present they are throughout this entire production, encroaching on every facet of it. From the cutscenes to Ryu's visual 
design to the gameplay where combat is interrupted by the murderer curse. You could even argue obliteration moves now being predominantly used on already neutralized foes is a gameplay change intended to service this story and characterize Ryu as overly bloodthirsty. The game sells itself with box art flaunting the striking and grim aesthetic of a Ryu visibly cursed by the souls of those he's slain. These topics are intended to be at the core of the experience, and if they're gonna be so prevalent that gameplay gets interrupted by scripted walking, then I think it should all amount to something more meaningful than I think it does to justify that. Yet all of this comes off as an attempt to flaunt the veneer of depth without much substance. Tell me about the dinosaurs. Maybe it was an earnest attempt to inject Ninja Gaiden with more complex subject matter, and maybe you got something out of it, but I was left underwhelmed by what it all amounted to here. Ryu doesn't reflect, and then we're told to stop reflecting. Not great. Once again, Ryu has a new voice actor for this game, and the direction here I think also manages to undermine the character examination they're going for. Your legend precedes you, you know. Nothing but stories. Word gets around fast. We got a welcoming committee! Don't misunderstand me, the new actor is a great performer. He's fit the role of characters in other games superbly. I've loved a lot of his other performances, and his performance isn't bad on a technical level here. It's just that the voice chosen seems out of place for Ryu. Both voices Ryu had in the first two games matched his character. I'm going to kill him. Hyper-focused, but high-strung and on edge, and emotionally repressed. My strength comes from training not from some curse in my blood. This fits the role of a savage killer, ruthless and all business, not exactly a people person. Righteous flames will cleanse the earth of your kind. Any feelings he did have seemed perhaps intentionally suppressed, so as to not let them have an influence on how he used and where he directed his power. Any time you could detect emotions were starting to bubble up, you knew some serious shit was going down. Like they're only just barely seeping out through this thick barrier of inner emotional suppression. Even in death, you could never understand him. In 3, Ryu just sounds way too much like some normal guy. Don't let it go to your head. With this cadence, he sounds like someone you'd expect to overhear at a cafe requesting an elaborate coffee order, and not a master killer. I'll train with you anytime you want. Oh. I don't think Ryu should sound like a chill American bloke about to surf a gnarly wave. Tell me about the dinosaurs. Before NG3, I had a very simple idea of who Ryu was, but the character felt consistent. Now I don't even know what to make of the character. The positive paragraph this video started out with unfortunately doesn't do much to outweigh how disappointing NG3 is, both on a gameplay and story level. When it came out in 2012, Ninja Gaiden 3 saw initial release on both Xbox and PlayStation simultaneously, a first for the series. Like 1 and 2 though, it would see a re-release on another platform with additions and changes. Though this time, rather than being called Ninja Gaiden Sigma, it would come with the suffix Razor's Edge, and initially release exclusively on a Nintendo platform, the Wii U. Though shortly after release on the Wii U, 360 and PS3 versions were also confirmed, so I hope you didn't get the Wii U just for it. Razor's Edge comes with the usual NG re-release additions, like extra chapters with someone other than Ryu to play as, but also additions that we're not used to seeing in an NG re-release, because normally they were there to begin with. Likely as a reaction to the relatively poor reception of the original version of 3, Razor's Edge adds currency you can earn to spend on an upgrade system, collectibles, different Nimpo attacks to use in the story mode, a large arsenal of weapons, extreme violence, and even boss health bars. Essence not coming back is still disappointing though. Instead of picking up Essence being what gives you currency, in Razor's Edge, karma points gained by performing well in battle or acquired from finding special collectibles can be spent to upgrade reusabilities. Karma being the series' new form of currency is a concept I'm into, making maximizing your performance throughout the game result in faster upgrading. But if I had to pick between Essence being in the game or Karma as currency instead, I would probably still opt for the inclusion of Essence first and foremost. Essence forced the player to make tough decisions in the heat of combat almost every battle, choices that could mean life or death for Ryu. Essence was a big factor during combat that didn't go away once you had enough 
enough upgrade points to buy everything in the game. That said, Essence still being a combat mechanic and Karma serving as currency would probably be the best of both worlds. Razor's Edge adds all the weapons from Ninja Gaiden 2 into the mix as you progress through the game, and they also must be upgraded. The upgrade system is an interesting one here. Some moves have been cornered off as individual upgrades, while weapon-specific abilities and combos are still given out linearly and in bulk. Overall, I think the addition of an upgrade system like this for Three's campaign is probably beneficial for most players, though it would be nice if weapon combos didn't feel like such an afterthought in this upgrade system still. If the intention is at all to hold newbies' hands more with this system, I wouldn't consider it a success overall. I think they'll still be left scratching their heads when bulk unlocking the overwhelming amount of combo chains received every time a weapon is leveled up. It's odd to me that acquiring non-weapon specific moves was made so user-friendly and clear, but weapon specific stuff is still just thrown to you without much direction. You'd think it would be one or the other across the board. A shame since the combos are easier to get to grips with than the way the player is introduced to them might suggest. Thankfully, the return of the Ninja Gaiden 2 weapons makes the title feel jam-packed with options again, though that might have something to do with the short length of 3's campaign. While I'm happier that they be here rather than they not be here, their inclusion can only go so far. Even with new abilities complementing them, these NG2 weapons still can't help but feel mostly like throwback content, that struggle to help 3's campaign carve out its own identity further. Some of the enemies from 2, originally only featured in the extra missions of Vanilla 3, are now added to the campaign as well. The overall issue is that injecting all of this 2 into 3's campaign now can at best only really serve to make Ninja Gaiden 3 a passable 2 expansion. It can't turn 3's campaign into what it should be, which is an action experience that pushes the franchise forward with a vast array of new compelling concepts and mechanics. Not one that has to borrow most of its toys from past titles to be passable. The main combat element distinguishing the Ninja Gaiden 3 experience from other NGs in Razor's Edge continues to be Steel on Bone, which thankfully has some reworked implementation to go along with its return here. No longer does it just pop off whenever. The attack now largely works as a sort of counter-maneuver. Enemies will now charge up these dark red aura attacks which can be countered by a strong blow to trigger steel on bone. Then you can keep mashing your quick attack to chain it to other enemies like before. Now this, in tandem with a larger pool of aggressive, critically injured enemies in RE, actually makes for a more strategic combat system, I think. And also, forgive me in advance, because discussing Ninja Gaiden starts to sound a lot more unhinged with the delimming back in play. Unlike in vanilla, obliteration moves now have a larger practical role again. Like in 2, now even common weakened enemies will remain a threat in their critical state. They'll keep attacking and are prone to suicide takedowns. An obliteration move will remove a single, now more dangerous enemy from the fight. But SOB, while harder to land, can be chained to hit multiple enemies, spreading out more damage for your efforts. So I like the risk-reward scenarios that can emerge there. Whittle down an enemy so you can obliterate and take one foe out of the fight, or go for the harder feat of pulling off SOB to deal more damage to a group, which inevitably requires giving a foe more room to breathe so they can go red aura on you. Since enemies seem more prone to pull out red aura attacks when critically damaged, delimbing and making your play for obliteration or SOB when an enemy is weakened is something to think about. There's a debate to be had about how balanced the overall implementation is, of course. Key can be expended to restore health, which is a move that always seems to bait a red aura attack out of an enemy. This can therefore be exploited to get SOB. You could say you have to stand still a bit and expend a resource to do that, so it's fair. Either way, I think I have to give the award for better steel on bone implementation to RE, because figuring out ways to trigger it here, no matter what that method may be, already is so much more satisfying now that SOB isn't just happening randomly on its own like in vanilla, where it could be granted to you for seemingly no reason. It's an immense step up. We've gone from obliteration having a reduced role and SOB acting out randomly to both epic zoom-in attacks being more fleshed out, each with their pros and drawbacks to consider while playing. 
I also think it's cool that obliteration is triggered by a proactive move, while SOB is triggered by a reactive move. If you're gonna have two types of epic zoom and takedown in your game, I think it works well to have them form a nice yin and yang type symbiosis like this. The execution scene at the start of the game has been removed, and since the story never really explored Ryu's thought process, it's not a great loss, I guess. Enemies no longer cry out in fear and terror when near death, which is an interesting choice. Now that Dismemberment is back, I get the feeling combining both screams of terror and the enemies being in little bits would perhaps make the game a little too uncomfortable. And I agree, it would make the game uncomfortable. But if Team Ninja want us to question where Ryu falls on the morality scale in this game, shouldn't we be seeing the uncomfortable reality? Shouldn't it be making us uncomfortable? By sanitizing the reality of Ryu's violence by even not showing the full extent of his carnage in the original NG3, or by making the enemies unfazed by it in Razor's Edge, in both cases, the premise gets undermined a little. Since they didn't explore that premise much anyway, I guess it's not a big deal. It's just funny to point out that now they felt the need to tone down their hardcore game about morality and violence twice in two different ways. I think you should probably either commit to your subversive, self-reflecting Ninja Gaiden story, or just tell another simple adventure tale with no greater pretense other than being about Ryu getting revenge or saving the world. I don't think this middle ground really works, where they want to challenge people with new topics for this series, but they also don't want to risk alienating anyone too much either. I guess it's good that in addition to all the pole mini games, a lot of the walking segments have been taken out. This includes a number of those instances where the curse is attempting to consume Ryu, and he has to stagger around trying to kill enemies majorly hung over. The replacement for these is a bit awkward though. Now most of the time when the curse hits, we teleport into a weird ethereal realm to fight some more enemies. I can see the issue Team Ninja probably had here. Remove the sequences where Ryu is afflicted by the curse and has to stagger around, and you've basically taken out any part of the game where the player is hindered by said curse, diluting its menace somewhat. But replacing them with just another fight with the same enemies you've just been fighting, albeit in a weird hell arena and with your health draining, is a bit of a slapdash alternative. Switching out Ryu waddling about for some proper combat I think is ultimately the right move, but the quick and dirty approach of these sequences does make the game feel a bit artificially padded, even if the intent was just to have the curse be better represented within Core Ninja Gaiden gameplay. It feels more like the game is being put on pause rather than giving us some authentic additional content. If I wanted to fight some enemies in an empty arena, I'd just boot up some extra missions outside of the campaign. I think making Ryu's arm sap his health in some of the fights that take place throughout the actual levels would have sufficed in giving the curse some menace. Razor's Edge is considerably harder than the original Ninja Gaiden 3. While this upping of the difficulty works in some places just fine, other scenarios don't seem like they were designed with such challenge in mind, making for some frustrating moments. One of the worst for me was the boss fight at the end of the new Ayane levels. Here they take a boss from a Ryu level and make you fight three of them at once. Boss fights exclusively feature a special camera lock-on function, but in this encounter it fell short in helping much. It's super aggravating when you use it to lock the camera on to an enemy here, but the attack lock-on which works independently sends your strike towards a different one. The final boss really takes the cake. A moment I barely registered in the original was a giant ordeal in RE. Here you have to kill enough enemies to fill an energy meter that will let you trigger a Nimpo attack when maxed out. Activating Nimpo once here will move you on to the next stage of the fight. In Razor's Edge though, you have to charge up twice the amount of energy, and I don't think this fight was originally designed for you to stick around in it so long. Killing these enemies is one thing, but you're just constantly under assault by the boss as well, who on top of attacking you keeps obscuring the view, or firing beams off at you just as you're leaving an obliteration animation or something. If you set the camera to face the boss and she starts getting in the way of your view of the enemies with her attacks, or you set it to face the enemies and her blows start getting harder to judge. My preferred strategy of choice is setting the camera to face the boss and sticking to the left side of the arena where it's less likely her pesky arm will get in the way. 
I have no doubt the devs of Razor's Edge wanted to please fans who thought the original release of 3 was too easy. But when that challenge is provided by a finicky camera that can't afford to screw you over this often when the difficulty has been raised this high, then nobody's having a good time. It's not tense in an enjoyable or exciting way. Unfortunately, when it comes to Ninja Gaiden 3, you have to take your pick between a bland, streamlined game with constant interruptions, or a weird, sometimes frustrating one that on its best day could be mistaken for a Ninja Gaiden 2 level pack with some weird cutscenes, but gets nowhere near close to being the game the third entry in this series should be. I think for fans of the series, Razor's Edge will feel like the better experience of the two, and if you've exhausted the previous titles, you could do worse than to test your medal here. It's hard to ignore how much of a Frankenstein's monster Razor's Edge is, but at least it seems to be shambling in the right direction. Watch yourself though, because the Wii U version of Razor's Edge, at least for me, was pretty buggy. In the T-Rex fight, already not exactly a highlight, for some reason my attacks refused to register at one point. I also had a moment where I had to reset my console because the next wave of enemies wouldn't spawn and I couldn't progress. All in all, I haven't come away from the Ninja Gaiden 3 titles with the most positive of experiences which is unfortunate because obviously a lot of talent worked on these two games. Ninja Gaiden 3 just went in a severely misguided direction, and while Team Ninja tried to earnestly fix that with Razor's Edge, only so much could be done. They tried to streamline Ninja Gaiden with Vanilla 3 for a modern audience and made it bland and mundane. They tried to add some more depth to the storyline and it came out both clumsy and undercooked. With only seven months to rectify things, it makes sense that the best that could be done was to staple a bunch of Ninja Gaiden 2 on top and make things a little harder. NG3 wound up being an example of how boiling down the complexity of your series to appeal to a wider audience doesn't always lead to success, especially to this degree. But I think they should have seen that one coming considering how caught the identity of Ninja Gaiden challenge and complexity was. Due to the poor reception of NG3, I don't think Team Ninja will make that mistake again though. Hopefully with that mistake recognized, they can one day return to the series and make the real follow-up Ninja Gaiden 1 and 2 deserved. Hard action games have had a spike in popularity lately, so I dare say there's no better time. Finally, before I go, there's a few topics I want to address quickly. First of all, as some of you have noticed throughout these videos, I haven't discussed the changes in staff at Team Ninja throughout the creation of the seven Ninja Gaiden releases we've looked at. It's just honestly not something I'm interested in discussing in terms of this series. I just wanted to assess the quality of the games themselves and not really speculate on why each one may have ended up the way it did based on the individuals involved. I recommend just reading up on who was in charge of each project if you're interested. Second, I don't really want to compare Ninja Gaiden 3 and RE to games released after them, but I think I might as well just throw it out there before people beat me to it in the comments, that yes, when it comes to action games about ninjas with stories that explore the difficult questions that arise when violence is used in the name of a cause, then 2013's Metal Gear Rising does a far better job. It's not perfect, I've discussed in prior videos where it makes interesting points and where perhaps it's a bit hokey, but compared to NG3, it's a masterpiece in this regard, with the protagonist having to self-reflect, justify himself, and debate his beliefs with others. At one point, it even has the guts to have you fight enemies that get brutally dismembered, while also letting you hear they're terrified in a monologue. Driving home the brutality of the protagonist's actions without trying to sanitize them like both versions of NG3 do in different ways. It commits to its ideas even if doing so isn't pleasant. While Ninja Gaiden 3 highlights the darkness of Ryu's actions but tries to excuse them at the end, Metal Gear Rising is more honest and wants to leave the player with those hard questions still lingering. At the end, rather than trying to reassure the player, it undercuts the triumph of victory with a final reminder that the moral high ground is unconvincingly held at the top of a pile of bodies. Third, I didn't cover the new multiplayer modes because I don't have Xbox Live, and I don't think anybody's even playing the Wii U version. Perhaps some other time if it's possible. Fourth, and finally, I want to take another look at one of the more controversial suggestions I've offered the 3D Ninja Gaidens in the past. 
that a manual heart attack lock-on could be a beneficial addition. I think it was perhaps a mistake to not emphasize more that the way the Ninja Gaidens estimate what you want to hit and auto-lock-on accordingly works pretty well most of the time. And honestly, I should probably stress that more whenever I discuss a 3D action game that manages to go without a manual hard lock-on and still play well for the most part regardless. But when the Ninja Gaiden game's auto lock-on made a bad call for me I didn't ask for, it felt like said situation could have been best prevented by a manual hard lock. Or perhaps at least at the minimum, some on-screen indicator letting me know who the auto lock-on has decided to target. I thought it would be hypocritical of me not to suggest the inclusion of a manual hard lock to solve said issues when I've done so for other action games that have suffered from a lack of that feature. Yeah, saying the Ninja Gaidens need a lock on is probably pushing it. But would I consider it a boon to the series to have it as another tool in Ryu's toolkit? Sure. It's not like it would need to be core to the game's combat. Some action games include it as a helpful feature for certain situations, even if it can be ignored for large stretches. I've heard it be said that the Ninja Gaiden games are too fast-paced for a manual hard lock-on, which is surprising to me. I'll go out on a limb and say that if you're a skilled player, it seems that hitting one extra input for a specific moment where you might want that extra bit of accuracy or control wouldn't be impossible even with the fast pace of Ninja Gaiden. What's so great about manual hard locks is that skilled players can make use of them to ensure the accuracy of some mad play towards a single enemy, or even more than one enemy by efficiently switching back and forth between multiple specific foes, in the case we add a switch target button as well. While on the flip side it can help newbies feel more in control and less overwhelmed when starting out on lower difficulties, by letting them keep their focus pinned on one foe to invest their attacks in. For one example where I could see a manual hard lock being especially helpful in Razor's Edge, how about using one to guarantee or avoid SOB countering an enemy charging up a red aura attack in a group? You could argue on-screen indicators darting around to indicate who's being targeted could have a negative impact on the aesthetics of Ninja Gaiden. But in this case, I wouldn't consider that worth preserving to such a strict degree in lieu of possible gameplay improvements. Anyway, that's going to be my look at the 3D Ninja Gaiden trilogy. I'll be the first to admit they're not the most in-depth videos possible on these games, considering how multifaceted they all are, but I think I've managed to get across how I generally feel about each one, and I hope you've enjoyed seeing me do so.